Hello all, welcome to Scientifica 22 once again. Today we have a, a talk on management of ROM deficits in orthopedics by Dr. Anil Bhave. To start the session, I call upon Dr. Nilima Bedekar, Professor and HOD of Musculoskeletal Physiotherapy at Sancheti Institute College of Physiotherapy, Pune. Ma'am is a research enthusiast. She is known to have multiple publications and she recently received a Lifetime Achievement Award for her contribution in physiotherapy. Yeah. Over to you, ma'am. Welcome all the delegates to a very interesting talk and I am honoured and privileged to introduce Dr. Anil Bhavi, sir, who is going to talk on management of range of motion deficits in orthopedics. He has got an extensive CV. I am trying to make it as short as possible. So, uh, excuse me, sir, for that. But due to the time constraints, we are making him it as short. Sir is clinical director, orthopedic rehabilitation. He is director of Russellman Gate Lab. He is director at Rubin Institute of Advanced Orthopedics at Sinai Hospital, Baltimore, USA. He has. Many, won many awards, accolades and accomplishments. A few of them needs to be mentioned here. He is the recipient of Jacqueline Perry, first prize award given by Orthopedic Rehabilitation Association in conjunction with American Academy of Orthopedics in 1999 for research project. Do PTB cast unloads the foot? He is recipient of IAP award oration in February 2001. He is recipient of lengthy specially scientific paper award in Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America in May 2002 for research paper on nerve injuries in limb lengthening, review of 900 cases. He received first place category rehabilitation poster at American Academy of Orthopedics Chicago March 2006, the ipsilateral hip dysfunction caused contralateral knee degeneration and champion of care Sinai Hospital Baltimore in 2013-15-17. Sir has to his credit patents and including apps. He has various certifications including augmented soft tissue stimulation ACYM therapy, trigger point needling, intramuscular therapy, sensory tester using pressure, specified sensory device, and many more. Major accomplishment at his current institute also includes the innovative, inexpensive, and custom-made dynamic splints for improving ROM. We are going to listen to him today on that. He has written eight chapters in various books. He has supported projects with grants, number is 13 plus. Article publication in the topmost journals at 71 and current research projects are ongoing 9 plus. His reviewer and consulting responsibilities in various journals and associations including the Journal of APTA Physical Therapy and Clinical Biomechanics. So, we are very lucky that Sir has given his precious time to us. So, welcome Sir again for Scientifica 2022 and we wish you will be here next year in physical presence in order to grace us and kindly um, you can start your speech Sir. So, uh, welcome again and we will be uh, taking through the range of motion deficits. Good evening. Uh, uh, thank you for introduction, and uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Bedeker, uh, for inviting me. 
as well as uh, thank you uh, to Sanchedi Physical, uh, Physical Ther Physiotherapy College and Academy for having me as a guest speaker on uh, your prestigious Scientifica meeting for 2022. I will be discussing the topic of how we manage range of motion deficits in orthopedics. Um, we will try to focus on knee joint as a problem, but these principles can be also applied to other joints uh, in our body for patients who de demonstrates deficit of range of motion uh, in our clinical practice. Uh, why do patients come to us? They come to us for two reasons. Uh, one is that they are in pain or they want to improve their function. And the function can only be improved if you have adequate strength. So that's the key for improving uh, function in our patients. We also want to make our goals of rehabilitation or physical therapy to be better, faster, and more cost efficient. Uh, months and months of physical therapy is not optimal in the current busy life of today. And we as physiotherapists all have to think that we need to make it better than before and we need to make it faster so that patients can improve faster and go back to their lives, normal lives quicker. And it has to be cost efficient so many people can avail our services and not select few. So keeping that in mind, uh, I have fashioned this lecture based on these main uh, principles. So whenever you see a patient that has range of motion deficit, what do I see first? I try to see what is the end feel. Is it soft? Is it guarding? A guarding can come from pain or it can come from increased tone or spasticity. In orthopedics, we mainly see patients guarding with pain and sometimes some slight change in tone because of pain. Then we have a semi-rigid end feel to the, uh, to the joint and rigid but can be manipulated are usually established orthofibrotic joints. And then you have a what, what I call doorstop. So I think the role of physical therapy uh, is very apt in the top four conditions where you have either a soft contracture, a guarding with restricted motion, semi-rigid, or sometimes even rigid contractures can be treated uh, by physiotherapy not just physiotherapy, but other techniques that I will show in my slides. Uh, but doorstop cannot be treated by physio physiotherapy. It, that needs to be treated with surgical option. And uh, here is an example of that in the knee joint. If you look at this knee joint, and I've done a x-ray and as well as a figure of a knee joint, the knee joint has a slope in the tibia as well as the femur. And that slope is about 60 degrees uh, as shown here. If the slope is decreased and goes past, let's see, 75 or 70 degrees, then as the patient tries to straighten the knee, he bumps against this femoral region here. And we call this deformity a procurvatum or a flexion deformity of the tibia. And any amount of physical therapy will never change the lack of knee extension in this patient. All you will do is open the posterior capsule and cause more pain. So we as therapists need to understand what works best for uh, our patients uh, in terms of uh, what kind of end feel do we have. A rigid end feel needs to have an x-ray taken carefully to see if there is a bony deformity or a bony alignment or osteophyte that is stuck in the joint that is not allowing you to get the joint to move. Anytime you put your hands on patient's leg or shoulder or arm and you can move the joint, then you have a reason to apply physiotherapy modalities. Even if it feels rigid, it still can improve, but a doorstop can never improve. So how do we manage range of motion deficits in 
patients have always believed that prevention is better than treatment. And when we get injured uh, or we have surgery, we call it RICE principle. RICE is rest, ice, compression and elevation. In my opinion, we have been doing this wrong for too long. It's not R in RICE doesn't stand for rest, it stands for range of motion. So early range of motion will prevent a lot of problems that we otherwise face um, in uh, lack of range of motion of the joints and careful range of motion, not too painful, not passive, but active assisted range of motion that's guided to the full capacity of the patient without causing swelling, without causing excessive pain, goes a long way <clears throat> in achieving uh, the range of motion uh, that uh, you want to achieve without having the significant complications that can occur later. So the, it's very important to remember that you must do the range of motion, preferably active or active assisted range of motion through the as much arc of motion as possible without causing excessive swelling or pain. So that's number one. Number two, of course, ice, compression and elevation all are critically important in early phase. Anytime the joint gets inflamed, uh, it generates more scarring. It also inhibits the muscle function. The muscles are likely to get more weaker. Compression helps with the proprioceptive abilities as well as compression directly helps with joint diffusions. And elevation does not, it reduces the overall swelling or edema in the legs, which can inhibit range of motion also. So remember, RICE does not stand for rest anymore, in my opinion, but it's range of motion, ice, compression, and elevation. <clears throat> so my opinion is we should focus on early mobility and flexibility, continue mobility with functional strength, apply for do functional improvements. In lower extremity, go for walking speed. People are walking too slow nowadays and we need to get them moving faster and we have to maintain the range that we have obtained and we should do follow up on our patient long term to make sure that they are doing well. So starting with early range of motion, this is an example of early range of motion. You can see the staples are still in. This is a patient that uh, had a quadriceplasty procedure and in that procedure it's important that you move quickly but not there's a difference between moving quickly and aggressively. You don't want to move aggressively to cause swelling or pain, but you have to move them through the range of motion without causing pain. And that's a technique, that's a feel, that's something that you develop over time when you start treating patients early on and you need to work with them to get them to use their muscles better, which is usually less painful than you as a therapist passively manipulating the limbs in an early post-operative phase or after any early injury that shows either bruising, bone edema, ligament strain, all of those can be managed. The only time you should not do early range of motion is if there is a tendon rupture that requires suturing, then you have to be careful and you have to follow the restrictions placed by your surgeons. But other than that, you should move early. There's also evidence that ankle sprains that move early too far better than ankle sprains that get immobilized and don't move early. So there's, a, there's evidence there building up now showing the value of early range of motion both after injury as well as... The one thing that is important to do is also stabilize well. When you stabilize well around the joint, it hurts less and there's less extra oscillatory movement that occurs. So stability of the joint as you move them through and have them work with you to achieve that motion is critical. The next uh, important thing is, I believe that when we are doing therapy, we are doing arthrokinematic therapy, meaning we are aligning the, aligning the joint better because as Mulligan has taught us that it's important to align the joint better and get arthrokinematics right as we move them through the joint. Otherwise, we are just compressing the joint and causing more pain and problems. So that's an important concept of getting arthrokinematic alignment through the range of motion with active, active assisted and some passive manipulation of the joint. 
as well as I call this resetting GTO or Golgi tendon organs. When you take the patient and have them go through the full range of motion, you are actually able to set the GTO of the quadricep muscle better and then thus they can function better throughout. There's also value for uh, uh, the CPM, not routinely used, but used frequently, especially in intraarticular pathologies or intraarticular injuries where there is significant bleeding that can occur and cause hemarthrosis or can cause extra fibrosis. And you can see here in this slide, this is from Dr. Salter's early work that shows that there is significant amount of hemarthrosis that occurs and with CPM, you are able to clean it, clean it up. And uh, that's an example of that. At 48 hours and at seven days, the joint gets much cleaned up because just of the range of motion and the nourishment that goes through the joint allows it. CPMs have their own faults and uh, some problems with promoting flexion contractures. So it's not routinely used, but when there is an intraarticular pathology, a depressed tibial plateau fracture that's been set up, or a, or a femoral fracture that is intraarticular that is repaired, it, it's a very good modality early on, not for a long time, but in the first 10 days to use for getting the joint to move pain-free through the range of motion we want. My favorite exercise for all the knees is something called safety, or slide and flex and tighten and extend. Okay, so we start that very early on, as you can see here, and we take this patient within 10 days of, uh, 10 to 12 days of uh, surgery, I think it's two got staples on through the full arc of motion. And then as, as he finishes his flexion range of motion, then he basically pushes down all the way by doing what we call tightening of the quadricep muscle, pushing against my hand. So in one exercise, you get multiple exercises, and that's my favorite. And we have been able to uh, do that uh, in yeah. all total knee patients. Every patient does 100 safety exercises every day at minimum. It's just close if I'm behind you. And that's Okay, start pulling. Good job. Keep going. One, two, three, four, five. Six, hold it there. Okay, push down, push down, push down. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. And I don't think you want to. The thing has been very useful. The other thing that is prevention is also identifying your high risk patients. This is a patient who has a motor vehicle accident and had pretty bad injury, a tibial fracture, and needed a total knee replacement. And you can see the scar, uh, medially, medial parapetal scar uh, that she had uh, for fixation that was later on removed. So type, a patient like this, uh, we are more alert as to how we manage this patient. We pre-made splints for her to use so that she can maintain both extension range of motion as well as later on in about a month time after her surgery, uh, knee flexion, uh, splinting. We started therapy a little bit more early on her, increased her frequency of therapy. So identifying this patient uh, early on or early, uh, identifying risk, risk stratification of also is another good strategy and you can have very good results uh, if you identify the problems that you can treat before. So if you want results like this, for example, this is a guy who had a bilateral femoral osteotomies, and you can see how crouched he is. And uh, within about uh, a month's time, or no, sorry, not month, about three months time, you can get results like this with normal gait. So in order to get that, how do you get there is a the question. Is it, do you get there by doing five hours of therapy every day for five days a week or, or doing therapy every day? Not necessarily. You can do achieve it by other methodologies, which is what I want to show you and discuss with you in, in short. So treatment strategies are always based on, is it an acute problem or chronic problem? How much pain patient is in? Does the patient have tone, a guarding? age of the patient and tolerance to splint wear. I believe in splinting a lot. 
I think it's an important regime of uh, therapy that many therapists don't use. I use it all the time for managing range of motion deficits in all my patients. I have made splints for both wrist, elbow. Uh, we use a shoulder custom splint made by a company called Jazz. Uh, we also have uh, splinting techniques for uh, hip, knee, as well as ankle. So we believe in splints a lot, and I'll show you why I believe in so much in splinting as an adjunctive therapy for uh, managing range of motion deficits. So what are the types of contracture? We see adaptive muscle shortening, that's usually guarding. Soft tissue adhesions are when you start having some fibrosis. Periarticular remodeling and pseudomyostatic contracture are usually later in phase and eventually a chronic subluxation can occur. This is the whole gamut. You don't want to go to the last two. You want to stay within the first three. And that's where you try to manage the first one so that you don't have the second and third. But if you have second and third, you must have the strategy to manage the scar tissue adhesions. So my method of managing this is I call multimodal treatment, meaning that I do everything. Just like very difficult diseases or cancer treatment is not one drug. One drug doesn't take care of it. I don't think physiotherapy should only focus on one thing at a time. We all pride ourselves, oh, I did manual therapy courses. I'm now great in manual therapy. Oh, I did muscle energy techniques. I'm good in that. Oh, I did mulligan technique in that. I think we have to encompass everything we got and just one hour of therapy three times a week is probably not going to solve your range of motion deficits. In my 44 years of experience as PT, I'm telling you, trust me, not one thing works. It's always a combination of treatments that work. So in my opinion, soft tissue mobilization through instrumented soft tissue technique works. Careful hand placement and manual therapy for arthrokinematics of the joint and GTO setting works. A splint as shown here works, but you have to do it in combination so that you can reduce your number of visits Patients have a lot of things to do at home, and you should always supplement your improvement in range of motion with improvement in strength, functional strength, meaning eccentrics. You must also use eccentrics uh, to do better. So that's my strategy. I call it multimodal strategy. And why do I develop it is that scar tissue is, if you look at the electron microscope of a scar tissue, this is how it looks. It's like a spaghetti in a bowl. So when you go to a restaurant and try to lift up the spaghetti, and if it's, it's congealed and it's together, the whole spaghetti bowl comes up in your hand. You have to use knife to cut it. So the same way when you try to move the joint, if the scar tissue is cross-linked like this, the joint doesn't move. It doesn't, it doesn't allow you flexibility in the joint. So the scar tissue extensibility is enhanced by tension applied to the area. So how can just manual therapy improve that? Once you start getting fibrosis, which can occur in four weeks after surgery, three weeks after surgery to three, six weeks after surgery. And when it's robust, then there's no treatment left. So we should not let it become robust and treat them before. So that's the critical uh, point that I want to emphasize that you must always think about this as to how is the scar forming and what can I do to physiologically alter it and splinting is one of the good techniques to do it. Not the only thing, but it's one of the good things to do it. After injury, you have a certain window. In my experience in totally replacement, you don't have more than six months. Three months actually is the best timing. Within three months, you get the maximum improvement in range of motion and supplement that with strength. And my personal feeling is when the scar turns, this is a, this is a staged total knee replacement. And you can see this scar is still pink on stretch, means there is improvement to be had. This is my clinical anecdotal evidence. When the scar turns white like this, there's no more improvement remaining. So I always tell my patients, I show this slide and say, you got three months to get this scar to be still pink and you have a range of motion improvement. Once that happens, you're not going to really do well. And this pink scar is not only in just white skin, you can see it in all skins. That's what to let you know that. So it's important to emphasize that to our patients and remember that there's a small window of opportunity you have. And this is what I show my patients all the time. 
This is what the kids have to wear for 18 months to 24 months. There is a gradual correction happening every day by putting attention on these wires. And if we can move teeth and bone with palate expander, we should be able to move the joints to have optimal range of motion. And that's the, the biggest take home message that I would like to give you in this lecture. And remember this duration of stretch, frequency of stretch, intensity of stretch, all matter. And usually you will see about three to 10 degrees per week, depending on uh, some of the tissue texture, meaning is it a soft contracture, rigid contracture, semi-rigid contracture, you will see it. And then you have the ability to specially splinting or technique, you have this ability to change it depending on the pain response here. I'm not going to go in detail with this, but you can add a splint and then if there is no change, reevaluate range of motion. Splint where is tolerated well, reevaluate TERT. What is TERT? TERT is total time under range of motion, end of end range of motion. And I'll explain that to you one second after I show you this slide. So this is a patient again, <coughs> loss of range of motion from a, a Tibial fracture because the surgeon tried to do manipulation and anesthesia at another institution and fractured the tibia and patient still had range of motion deficit after a revision total knee arthroplasty. So when I got her from another institution to see, that's how she was moving, uh, really limited range of motion, especially flexion, extension is slightly lacking and you can see it better here in terms of her flexion as well as her extension lacking by 10 to 15 degrees. So I did, this, I did the same thing that I always do. Um, I do a multimodal treatment strategy, which is what I did on her. And I only treated her for two times a week for two months. That's all I did. But I had her using the splint every day at home for three to four hours per day, which was the critical piece of. A similar uh, management of this was done. And patient was dissatisfied, had a minus 25 to 75 range of motion had arthroscopic lysis at another institution, initial improvement then back to again. So we did all the things that we should do, dynamic bracing for extension, flexion, uh, and this is our soft tissue technique method. This is our bracing technique that I have developed for both knee extension and knee flexion. Very simple technique using polyester, uh, casting material that we can use with just simple TheraBand and hinges. And uh, well, the brace on the left side is meant for extension stretch, as you can see. And the brace on the right side is meant for flexion stretch, as you can see here. And so for flexion stretch, patient has to sit. For extension stretch, patient has to uh, be in supine or long sitting position. They cannot walk with this. And the approximate time they spend in both the braces about three to four hours per day but it's rewarding to them if they're going to improve, then you can change the band strength by going from yellow to red to blue, black, whatever is appropriate for the body weight and the type of contracture. We also, in some patients who have extension lag, use this uh, knee brace that has extension assist bands and think of it like this. You're walking 3000 steps a day. Every step you take, you're getting a stretch on your knee with this, this brace. So we like it. We use it in some of the specific conditions, patients who have extension lag and a flexion contracture, we will use it for the, for the knee patient. And that's finally, that's the result, full extension. And uh, I'm gonna move myself so you can see the slide. I hope you can see this, but she has almost full flexion at the knee, 125. And she's doing really well. So, uh, and she has good eccentric control. I know you need to have eccentric control to come down. So it's functional strength through eccentric exercises after getting range of motion is critical. This is another case uh, where uh, this is a basketball player who had a tendon rupture, pretty tendon rupture, pretty bad. Uh, it was uh, protracted. 
Um, she didn't, didn't have just patellar tendon rupture, but also had a uh, quad tendon partially torn. Um, uh, she had uh, needed a big allograft. And that's why when you do allograft, you have to keep the patient in extension a brace for at least uh, six to eight weeks before the tendon graft heals. And then you got to go really slow <clears throat> in uh, rehab. So we did the standard treatment, the a treatment around the scar, which is the instrumented soft tissue mobility, um, arthrokinematic joint mobilizations. Um, and then uh, she even actually got some uh, 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 a blood flow restriction therapy for her improving strength. That's a new thing that we have been using, very impressed by it. And then we use the, this, the, this brace, uh, it's called jazz device and it really talks the leg well. And sometimes we'll use this instead of that because you want to get, my brace only goes up to 100 to 105 degrees, which is okay for most older patients, but the young patients want more range of motion. So by turning, it's a turnbuckle splint and you can gradually stretch it, hold it, then stretch again, hold it. And eventually uh, this girl really did well and had a full range of motion. Uh, that's a 140 degrees of flexion. And you can see the scar, it's a pretty extensive scar all the way up here to down below the tibial tubercle all the way because they had to find the recessed tendons and re-suture it with allograft. Um, uh, so that was pretty uh, big surgery. And uh, she has she had full function, she was very happy. This is a case I have shown before many times. Uh, this is another case of pretty bad arthrofibrosis, uh, really bad pain. Full walk and same thing again, having tr trouble getting knee extension, having minimal knee flexion. Can these patients be made better with just physical therapy and not doing another surgery after surgery? I believe so. We have the power to do it. We just have to follow certain principles. But eventually we got her to do pretty well. You know, this is just with about four months of PT and a multimodal treatment approach. So Lots of patients have been like this. Uh, we've had success with it. This is our gait in the gait lab. We just wanted to check how she walks. Now, this is a different problem. This is a, a patellofemoral pain problem. So you can see she has laterally subluxed patellas. This is a case that I have 10 year follow up now on. So you can see clearly she has slightly uh, 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 ever, you know, not everted, but subluxed, not slightly, pretty significant subluxation of the patella. And uh, basically she is a um, runner, did marathons, no running for one year due to pain. And significant findings were tight iliotibial band, weak hip abductors, increased. Eye. So this is a complete biomechanical evaluation of her. I can show you there. And we basically followed the same principles. We did the multimodal approach, only 12 visits. But we had a good home exercise program for her. She, her husband was involved in stretching her. She was tape a lot. We used to rehab her with the tape. And eventually we got it pretty well located. Most patients like this usually get lateral retinacular releases. In our center, we did it with physical therapy. So careful analysis of the problem uh, and treatment can go a long way. I truly believe that uh, a early loss of range of motion after injury or surgery is not patient problem or patient is uh, weak or this and that. It is early fibrosis. We should not blame the patients. It's a physiologic problem that we need to identify and treat. As always, I said, prevention is far better than treatment later on. So we should do everything to prevent problems, reduce pain, reduce inflammation, do compression, do ice, and do early active assisted range of motion, maybe with slight passive nudge at the end of the range of motion, or overpressure as we call it, to get them moving through the joint. As they move through the joint, then get them into more 
functional training program, use NMES if you have to, use uh, the t other techniques like uh, arthrokinematic therapy or manual therapy, but don't just get stuck on that. Use other modalities to make the patient better. And with this, I will uh, end my talk. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not joining you live since I have another commitment on a Saturday, that, uh, meaning your Friday night, that I have to attend to. But it was, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I want to thank again the organizers for inviting me. Thank you, sir, for your excellent talk. I know it's not enough for us. We would like to know much more, but the time constraints are very, very short considering the amount of information you have, sir, on this management of range of motion deficits. I'm really impressed and the way you have explained about how simple things can make the progress so much. So thank you again. Thank you all the delegates. Um, have a good night. Thank you, Bhave sir. Thank you, Bedekar ma'am. With this, we come to an end of fun-filled and knowledgeable sessions of day one. Wishing everyone a very good night from Scientifica organizing team. See you all tomorrow at 9 a.m. for another day of exciting and knowledgeable panel discussions, invited talks, and paper presentation, followed by our valedictory. Good night, everyone. Thank you.